or you shouldn't shower because water is dangerous. It means you got to be careful. There was I actually investigated these cases. There was one case of a woman. She clearly was mentally ill who had gastroenteritis and was throwing up and had diarrhea and on her own was doing four to five enemas an hour and after about 32 enemas had a seizure and died. Well, she had she had diarrhea and was vomiting, which can cause an electrolyte disturbance and died. So the Seattle coroner and his genius said, this is a death attributed to coffee enemas. Well, uh, yeah, you know, 32 enemas a day. No one would tell her to do that. Um, and the other case was a patient with advanced uh, metastatic breast cancer in the liver, the lungs, and the brain who'd been treated unsuccessfully with chemo and more chemo and more chemo, went to an alternative clinic in Mexico and was doing enemas and had a seizure and died, but she had brain tumors. And the Seattle coroner could not really say that the coffee enemas had created an electrolyte balance, but claimed that because she was doing enemas, that's what killed her, forgetting the fact that she had widely metastatic breast cancer into every organ in her body and had failed chemotherapy. So the cases, and there are only about three that I've been able to find, are really, to say the least, kind of sparse and weak. And far more people die each day, each day from chemotherapy. These are three cases in the last 30 years that I've been able to find, and I've searched the entire world's literature. There are about three patients dying every hour from direct effects or indirect effects of chemo and radiation. So you have to put it in context. They're not dangerous. I mean, uh, the, the, I've never, in fact, when I was in research under Dr. Good, just to prove how safe they were, I did 12 enemas a day for about, I don't remember, it was two weeks, and I checked my electrolytes, and they were perfectly fine. I mean, it was a kind of a, boring to do 12 enemas a day, but I just want to prove how safe they were, and they didn't change my electrolytes at all. That's I actually wrote to the Seattle coroner and didn't answer me. Then I called him and didn't take the call. sent a spe- special delivery letter, which he didn't answer. Because I, I confronted him. I said, I, I don't agree with your findings. He, he reported two cases of death due to coffee enemas was the name of the article. And I, I thought his, his conclusions were nonsensical, that his, his, pre- his prejudice overcame his common sense. And he never answered me, which and I was in you know, conventional research at that time, which was inappropriate. If there's a question about the, your, your research, you always answer. And he didn't. And I sent several letters, several calls, never answered him. So you know, I wasn't impressed. And I've not been, there was one case in uh, the Southwest Medical Journal of a woman, with, again, with advanced cancer that ended up with sepsis. But the, even the author was actually um, very calm about it. He says, you know, we, advanced cancer patients who had chemo radiation developed sepsis was a bacterial infection that killed her. It, could the all coffee enemas have contributed to it? Probably uh, they, they may have, but it's, I don't see that. I mean, this is one case. But it's a whole systems thing. There are other things that were going on that were not reported. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. right. In these that's cases, the like the Seattle coroner case, I actually tracked down the, the cases. I actually tracked them down. I was able to do that. And the, the, the woman who was doing that four enemas an hour for, with, with vomiting and diarrhea, you end up dead from vomiting and diarrhea if it's untreated. And she was you know, obviously not with it and was doing this on her own instead of going to an emergency room getting a rehydration for her dehydration. So there are like three cases that I've been able to find, and they're just, you know, really not very impressive. And, you know, I've treated thousands of patients with coffee enemas. The Gerson people have treated tens of thousands of patients over the last, you know, 60 years with coffee enemas. So basically, even a person in good health can do a coffee enema a day and get great value out of it, correct? Look, I think everyone should do coffee enemas because and people say, well, well, the world's abnormal. And, you know, my liver was not designed to deal with uh, 2011 toxicity. It wasn't designed to do that. It was designed to deal with, uh, you know, 4,000 years ago toxicity, not today's toxicity. And it needs extra things. And I do them. I've done them for 30 years, and I, I, I know they help my health. Um, do you, you know, feel my... better after you do it? Always. I have, since the first day I did it under Kelly's direction, um, I felt better. And, you know, I grew up on junk food. When I was in college, I used to eat Twinkies for lunch. Can you imagine an adult college student eating Twinkies for lunch? Yeah, I was there. I was doing that. I wasn't raised doing coffee enemas. Um, I, had, I had very good genes, so I got through it and was able to, you know, take good nutrition out of junk food. I was, otherwise, I'd have been sick as a dog. But when I met Kelly, I had to continue eating that way. I've ended up in problems. But I started doing the program. I did the enemas, and I felt great from the first day. never looked back. Your liver must be incredibly clean. Um, I'd like to think so. Really? <laughs> you should have your liver checked. <laughs> yeah, well, I have. I know I've done ultrasounds, and it looks great. And, you know, we, I have to do blood work and all that. My liver's in great shape. Let's talk about the supplements that people take, because I know the vast majority of the people that come to you are already ill, but not all supplements are the same, and that's why Dr. Kelly had to make his own, and you also have your own made. Explain why. Yeah, first... You know, we're using supplements for a specific reason. We're using it to manipulate the autonomic nervous system. That's the reason we use supplements. You know, in the alternative world, conventional, antioxidants do this. Antioxidants protect against cancer. I don't care about that. I care about 
what effect each vitamin, mineral, trace element, fat, protein has, amino acid has on the autonomic nervous system. And Kelly designed his supplements and we've designed our supplements based on that approach. That we, that when we have supplements for our meat eaters, supplements for our vegetarians, supplements for our parasympathetic dominance, sympathetic dominance, balanced people, and they're completely different. It's like they're different species. And the forms vary. Like the calcium that a sympathetic dominant does best with is different than the calcium that a parasympathetic does best with. And you have to be that precise, otherwise you're going to get cockeyed results. So we designed our own supplements, and we use them very precisely with the, ga- with the goal of bringing the autonomic nervous system into balance. So it's a completely different approach, hypothesis, thesis, theory, than uh, both conventional alternative doctors interested in nutrition employ. Uh, so that's the way we approach it. And this, the, the supplements we need for that purpose are not available in the health food stores, and no one knows anything about it. No one cares about that. So we had to design our own supplements. And also, most pancreatic enzymes out there commercially over-the-counter as prescription items are not really made very well. And we had to develop our own process for making enzymes, which took a lot of time and money, but they really are made the way we want, and they're made by the process that we use. It doesn't, most enzymes are extracted using very toxic chemicals. Our enzymes are made without the input of any toxic chemicals at all. So we had to find a way to make enzymes that didn't involve using toxic alcohols and really nasty chemicals. And also they're made in New Zealand, am I correct? Yeah, they're made in New Zealand, and we use New Zealand-raised pigs. New Zealand has the strongest laws for raising animals. They never had mad cow, trichinosis, foot and mouth disease. Um, you can eat raw pork in New Zealand if you wanted to. Um, and their animals are all grass-fed. They don't, they don't use feedlots. So... It's the cleanest stuff. It's first. It's the cleanest environment left on Earth, and the cleanest animals with the strictest laws. So that's where we get our pancreatic enzymes, which are made from the pork pancreas. You know, they slaughter the animals for the meat industry, and we just buy their pancreases and use them to make enzymes. Do you think there will be a time when becoming a patient of yours, since you and your associate Linda, you're the only two people in the country doing what you're doing, the way that you're doing it, using the model and the exact precision of Dr. Kelly's model. Do you think there will come a time when the affordability quotient of becoming a patient will go down, kind of like computers go down over time? Or do you think that there's only so many hours in a day? And Well, the, the thing is, we don't run an assembly line. You right. Know, uh, people say we're not cheap. Well, you know, I'll spend four to five hours with each new patient. Um, I don't shun it off to a, you know, a nurse or a physician's assistant or a technician. I do it myself. And when you're dealing with life and death, you really have to know who your patient is, because, and especially in our situation where people are all over the world, they can't come in just for an office visit if they have a headache. And I have to make you know, quick decisions on management with very sick patients, often over the phone, um, based on you know, our, our therapy. It's a lot of time. I mean, uh, you know, I don't, first, I don't want to run an assembly line. I want to give people the time they need. And to do this kind of metabolic therapy really requires time. And any conventional alternative doctor that doesn't, isn't willing to invest the time really shouldn't be doing this therapy. It isn't, you know, chemotherapy's cookbook. You have the, the little book which has all the doses. That this is the cancer, this is the drugs you use, and this is the doses according to weight. You know, and a, a, a technician or a nurse can do it. it doesn't, it's just cookbook stuff. And a lot of alternative medicine is the same. You know, cancer, you give this dose of vitamin C intravenously, et cetera. With us, everything's individualized. It takes a lot of time. You have to explain patients how to do it. I mean, yeah, we could train people how to do it, but, you know, you also have to bond with your patients because you're in the trenches with these folks. You want to know who they are and they're how they're thinking and, you know, all those things, because their mood, their attitude, all those things play into how they're going to do. Do they have to be a New York resident to become your patient? No, most of my patients are not from New York. We have an international practice. I have patients from Singapore to Israel, and most of them are not from New York. We have New York patients, of course, but most of them are not from New York. They're all over the country. I don't know if they're 50 states, but just about. Do they have to do blood work? Most of the patients we see have been tested, you know, extensively, but we they have to do basic blood work and... Uh, you know, have their medical records sent to us. If it's Lyme disease or brain cancer, we have to see their medical records and blood work. And if they don't have blood work, we order it. So it's standard doctor-type stuff. And, we, you know, we do scans and all that, but we, we use them cautiously. CAT scans have a lot of radiation. you got to be careful about overusing them. So we do standard testing in addition to our own testing to determine the metabolic type. It's a very exciting world that you live in. Well, it's never dull, I'll say that. It's a lot of work, but it's never dull. I mean, you have to, you know, this is another thing for other doctors. You really have to work hard to do this because you'll have, you know, 10 patients on 10 different diets, and you've got to know the intricacies of every diet and every supplement program, and it sounds overwhelming, but, you know, you get good at it. You just know. So you, you, but it takes some training. This is not something, you know, I, I lecture, as you know, and often I'm going to lecture to a group of doctors in late June, and, and 
Las Vegas. And often it's frustrating because doctors go to these seminars thinking in, in two hours they're going to learn how to do this.